Reading Antoine de Saint-Exupéry's masterpiece, The Little Prince, was absolutely life-changing. I read this for the first time only a month ago, and I can, without hesitation, tell you that it is in my top two. And for reference, I hold a PhD in literature, and I've been teaching English for the past 19 years, so I've read a lot of books, you guys, a lot of books. And so I'm thrilled to offer an analysis on this beautiful story. This is an allegory, a fable, a fairy tale, a parable, a children's book, but it's one written for adults more than children. In the dedication, the author says, I want to dedicate this book to the child whom this grown-up once was. All grown-ups were children first, but few of them remember it. And we should consider how a grown-up is defined in this book. I think it has nothing to do with age and everything to do with one's character and one's outlook on life, love, relationships, the universe. Get ready to talk about a story filled with real philosophical considerations, the wisdom of children, and the imperative life lessons that at one time or another we all knew, but we have since forgotten, put aside, or been too busy to prioritize. If you are an adult and you haven't read The Little Prince, I don't think that there is another book that I would so highly recommend because it so adeptly shows us, reminds us, you know, truly of all the meaningfulness of life. And we're all seeking that out, right? Hey guys, I am Dr. Whitney Costers. Thank you so much for joining me today. And as I said earlier, The Little Prince is easily in my top two favorite books. Maybe it's because I'm a mom of little ones. Maybe it's because I'm well into adulthood. Maybe it's because I, like so many others, am totally overworked. Maybe it's because time seems so elusive. Or maybe it's because I'm surrounded by a community of people who are, more often than not, stressed out in really unhealthy ways. Whatever the case, this book, with every reading, impacts me to the core, so I'm especially excited to discuss it today and to hopefully begin a discussion with you here on YouTube because I would truly love to hear how you experienced this phenomenal book. I'm clearly not the only one who cherishes this book. Did you know that as of today in 2024, The Little Prince, originally written in French, has been translated into 571 languages and dialects? That is an astounding number, and I think that it speaks to the universality that this book, published over 80 years ago, still carries today. All in all, my circumstances and I are not unique. I think I saw facets of myself in so many of the adult characters, and I'm guessing that that's the case for a lot of readers too. In many ways, I think adulting often limits our ability to explore and appreciate what lies before us, but in some ways, that limitation must be imposed upon us in order for us to survive and thrive in adulthood, yeah? It's a very complex and demanding stage of life, to say the least. When does this happen to us? As teenagers, in our 20s, 30s, 40s, when we get real responsibilities that carry serious consequences, after we move out of our parents' house? As absurd as they are, we are the businessman, the king, the lamplighter, the drunkard, the vain man, and the geographer. Somewhere and at some time, the baobab seeds that the little prince talks about are planted, and too often we don't tend to them right away, and we let them get out of control. So maybe that small desire for success has suddenly sprouted into an insatiable hunger for power and money that ultimately consumes us, blinds us. Like the characters we meet in the book, we have somehow gotten caught up in those matters of consequence. Power, numbers, work, stress, ego, money, responsibility, what needs to be done, haven't we? And we justify this because in life there's always something to be done. Between the homework, the studying, the chores, the jobs, the cleaning, the meals, the responsibilities, the kids, the meetings, the extracurricular activities, the college applications, the errands, there is a human who just needs to rest, to enjoy, to just be. How many of us are forced to work multiple jobs or even just one job for eight to 10 hours a day just so that we can pay the minimum on our monthly bills, hopefully save enough to put money down on a house, buy a car and other essentials, and in doing so, sacrifice ourselves, our time, our peace, our mental health, our moments with our families and our friends. How many of you are only 19 or 20 years old and attending school full-time and working too? I have gotten more emails than I can count of students telling me that they are stressed out of their eyeballs between work, family, responsibilities, and school. 
Do you have friends that you have to schedule outings with months in advance because they're that booked up? And the problem is that it's just getting worse in our increasingly digital world where we can literally do almost anything on our phones and are so are expected to be multitasking 24 hours a day. And listen, I get it. I mean, I am one of these people. If I'm to be honest, I have let life consume me between taking care of my children, cleaning my house, doing the laundry, cooking the meals, working full time and ensuring that it all gets done when it needs to get done. I have definitely gotten lost in all of it from time to time. And so in the midst of everything that's expected of us, it's no surprise that we tend to lose sight of the really important things in life that the little prince teaches us. Of the six planets that the little prince visits, it's the fourth planet where he meets the businessman who is so busy, he doesn't even have the time to raise his head to acknowledge the little prince's arrival. Has anyone ever walked into the room and you're so glued to your phone trying to pay your bills, finish that email, sign that form, or answer that message that you don't even show them the courtesy to look up? The businessman is a model of absurdity to the little prince who can't quite comprehend the point of the businessman's business. All day, every day, the businessman counts the stars, which he claims he owns. And that is a serious business counting the stars since it does him the good of being rich, which in turn allows him to buy other stars if somebody discovers them. And in the end, all he does is write down the number of stars on a piece of paper that he then deposits in the bank. This is what so many of us strive for day in and day out, as though the amount of money that we own and have defines our value and our purpose. But what really is his purpose? When would it ever be enough? Is there ever a stopping point or will he simply continue to run himself ragged, never stopping for a break? In fact, he admits that because he's a serious person, he has never stopped counting and has only been interrupted three times, once because he suffered from a fit of rheumatism since he has no time for exercise. Put in these terms, it's clear that the businessman's purpose is endless, that there is no joy in his life. There is no time for anything else, even his own physical and mental well-being. He is driven by the perpetuity of the accumulation of money, wealth, and ownership. But these very things do not bring him joy, freedom, or time. In fact, quite the opposite. And the imaginative and even scientific quality of stars, that they are these diamonds twinkling in the sky, something that you can wish upon, these balls of gas that can light up an entire planet, symbols of merit or hope, the homes of angels, are inconsequential to someone like the businessman who sees them only as commodities to own, to count, and from which to derive his wealth. And of course, this is why the little prince leaves the businessman remarking, grownups are really quite extraordinary. This must be what so many children think of us when they ask us to play, imagine, and create with them while we are counting our stars, so focused on our tasks and our self-importance. So the next time that your little one asks you to see his extraordinary makeshift museum that he created in his bedroom, or a friend asks you to grab a coffee, stop cleaning, stop doing the laundry, get off your phone, stop working for the moment, whatever it is that you're doing, and go join them. The next adult that the little prince encounters is the lamplighter, whose job is to light a street lamp and put it out to indicate day and night. Unlike the businessman's work, the lamplighter has a useful job. However, it's important to acknowledge how the job impacts the lamplighter. He explains that his job used to be reasonable enough. I put the lamp out mornings and lit it after dark. I had the rest of the day for my own affairs and the rest of the night for sleeping. But now, even though his orders haven't changed, the circumstances have, since year by year, the planet is turning faster and faster, which means that now the planet revolves once a minute. I don't have an instant's rest. I light my lamp and turn it out once every minute. And now, not only is there no time for his own affairs, but there isn't even time for him to sleep. The lamplighter's circumstances resonate strongly with our situation today. 50 years ago, a middle-class family could easily live on a single income, and a college degree wasn't even necessary to live comfortably. 
people came home from work and they didn't work. They lived and enjoyed and spent time with their families. That's not the case anymore. Now, a four-year degree or a postgraduate degree is crucial to getting a decent job that may or may not pay you a salary that will afford you the house that you want since interest rates are so high or the groceries you need since two pounds of strawberries are literally $12 a carton. And that smartphone of yours ensures that even after you leave the office, you're still on call in some way or another. We are pro multitaskers, rendering us busier and more stressed out than ever before, I think. We are the lamplighter. We want purpose. We want work. We want to be useful and we want to contribute, but we can't healthfully go on at this speed anymore. Something has to give. And the little prince, the wise child that he is, shows the lamplighter how he can change his circumstances. He says, I can show you a way to take a rest whenever you want. All you have to do is walk more slowly and you'll always be in the sun. When you want to take a rest, just walk and the day will last as long as you want it to. Now, this is good, reasonable advice, teaching the lamplighter that if he doesn't like his circumstances to make the changes that he can that are within his control, which is something that I think we all must do. So what can you give up for the greater good of your health and time? Instead of taking five classes a semester, maybe take four. Modify or extend your long-term goals so that you can cut down to working part-time instead of full-time while you're still in school. Maybe the house doesn't always need to be spotless, so stop cleaning all the time. Maybe your kids don't need to be in three different extracurricular activities. Maybe you don't need to be a board member on your HOA, PTO, or at your local church. Whatever it is, reconsider some of the commitments that you make that takes precious time away from your health, yourself, and your family. Do we really all need to do the things that we've set out to do? Are we all just setting ourselves up for massive burnouts like the lamplighter is? The next adult that the little prince encounters is the geographer. This man lives on a majestic and beautiful planet, but even though the geographer's purpose in life is to know where the seas are and the rivers and the cities and the mountains and the deserts, he has not explored or seen his planet, proclaiming that a geographer is much too important to go wandering about. He merely records what the explorers share with him as long as what they say is interesting. The geographer lives in his books. He lives off of other people's experiences. He is the guy who lives by scrolling through TikTok, listening to other people's movie and book reviews, and watching others travel, do home improvements, and enjoy culinary, shopping, and other exploratory experiences. The geographer is a scholar and is too important to do anything outside of his books. The lesson then is don't forget to explore, experience, and, in, and just do. What are you missing out on? Try that new restaurant, go on a walk with a friend, check out your local arts festival, take a day trip, meet a new human, whatever. But live. Don't rely on other people to do it for you. As the geographer even says, the moral character of an explorer may be compromised, so who knows if what someone else tells you about this experience or that experience is even accurate or true. In fact, how could it be? It's their experience, not yours, and only you can capture that authentic experience for yourself. The Little Prince also meets a very vain man, a human who only sees the world as it suits his ego and is blinded to everything else, which significantly limits his scope, and a drunkard who lives in a cyclical self-imposed pain and suffering, acknowledging his problem, drinking, and using the problem to forget he has a problem. He explains that he drinks to forget that he is ashamed of drinking. And, of course, the little prince is puzzled, to say the least. I mean, primarily because he is a child and so does not understand the complexities of abuse, suffering, self-worth, and the psyche. But the adult reader does. We are being reminded that if we are in an unhealthy, a toxic situation or relationship, we cannot justify it, ignore it, hide it, defend it, or hope it will get better on its own. In other words, we must not contribute to our problem and create a cycle of suffering that will ultimately take its toll on us. Take the first step by acknowledging the problem and seeking out the help you need to remove yourself from the toxicity. 
After all, we know that drinking to oblivion will not solve or even ameliorate the drunkard's shame or his problem. In fact, it will merely exacerbate them. And this is what makes the drunkard so depressing to both the little prince and to us. And then there is the king who sits on a majestic throne, ruling over no one or no thing, but bases his entire identity and sense of self on his power and rule. This figure is a satirical model of politics, government, and the unnecessary desire for power among humans. As the little prince remarks, there is nothing to be ruled over on the king's planet, but that doesn't matter. What matters is the king's sense of sovereignty. But as you'll notice, the king's commands are wholly dependent on the very things that the little prince already expresses a desire to do. If the little prince says he cannot help but yawn, the king commands that he do so. If the little prince asks to sit down, the king commands that he do so. Now, it's clear that though the king wants full power and control, he's reasonable enough to understand its limitations. After all, he knows that he cannot command a general to turn into a seagull. It's just not physically possible. So in order to preserve his sense of rule, he does not command it. And sure, he will command a sunset for the little prince, but he'll do it when the sunset is about to occur. It's an empty and a lonely life for the king who thrives only on his absurd sense of power, so much so that he begs the little prince to stay on his planet, bribing him with the opportunity to be a minister of justice over a rat that may or may not exist. In other words, what matters to the king is not really the authority of his power, but rather the self-importance that this sense of power instills in him. Do you know anyone like this? But no matter how important he may feel, it's clear that the king's total obsession with power ensures that he will forever live a deluded and empty existence that consists of meaningless performances of authority over nothing. And it not only renders him vacuous and absurd, but it also precludes him from appreciating the beautiful things that stand before him. Like the businessman, the king does not see any real value in the stars that he reigns over. They're simply mere subjects to be reigned over. Each of these men that the little prince meets are disappointing, strange, or bewildering to him. They've been caught up in the very things that the world teaches us are priorities, necessary, or important. Early on, we learn from society that power, purpose, and money will get us far, while emotional and mental well-being, imagination, and creativity may be placed further and further on the back burner. In fact, the first thing that the narrator discusses is his drawing of the elephant inside the boa constrictor that he made at the age of six. He is disappointed and frustrated that all the adults he shows the drawing to can only see it as a hat. And even when he tries to show them the elephant inside and explain to him why it's not a hat, he is discouraged from such creativity and is told to put his drawings away and apply himself to geography, history, arithmetic, and grammar. And as he says, that's why he abandoned a magnificent career as an artist. So in the first two pages, we are reminded how crucial it is to encourage creativity, to keep an open mind, to allow imaginations to thrive, to understand that things don't always need to be explained or proven, to think outside the box, and to not conform just because that's what everyone says you should do. And as a parent, I see parents in schools overparenting, prioritizing, and obsessing over test scores and grades. And I see parents pushing their children to follow in their footsteps, meet that level of perfection, get into that Ivy League college, join the sundry extracurricular activities that require their kids to go to practice three to four times a week and then play two to three games on Saturday and Sunday. And in the midst of that, I witness too many young children and young adults who are burnt out, stressed out, depressed, anxious, and putting much of their sense of self-worth into the numbers, the grades, the scores, the wins, and the losses. And when those numbers don't work out, as can often happen, our sense of selves can plummet. When too much is expected of us, when that incoming college freshman is supposed to work a full-time job, but also tend to the full-time job that college is too, we leave them no room, no space, no ability for creativity, freedom, and imaginative matters. It's robbed of us, but it's not forever lost. 
we can get it all back. We just have to remember and practice the lessons that the little prince promotes. This is why when the little prince asks the narrator to draw him a sheep, he is unsatisfied with the sh three sheep that the narrator draws him. You know, one is too sickly, one looks too much like a ram, and the last is too old. He is only satisfied with the drawing of a crate, a crate which houses the sheep, because now he can imagine any kind of sheep, one that suits him. A particular drawing of one kind of sheep is limiting and finite, and so it cannot afford him the imaginative freedom to let the sheep be what he wants it to be. Let's now turn to one of the most important meetings that the little prince has, and that is with the fox. It is here that the little prince learns what love is and thus what the real meaning of life is. It is companionship, connection, devotion. Love, says the fox, results from taming another creature. And what he means by this is when you create unique ties between one another. What have you sacrificed for your relationships with your family, your friends, your pets, your lover, your children? What have you given to help those grow and develop? What sort of meaning and value have you given to these relationships? Have you invested in them? As you know, relationships can be really challenging and difficult, but they are worth it. Humans are social beings who thrive on connectedness and togetherness, but not just with anyone. You'll remember that the little prince loves his rose who remains waiting for him on his planet. But on Earth, he comes across thousands of roses seemingly like her and thinks, I thought I was rich because I had just one flower and all I own is an ordinary rose. It doesn't make me much of a prince. And we're told that he lay down in the grass and wept. But the fox says he misunderstands. In fact, these roses are nothing at all like the little prince's rose. They have not been cared for, devoted to, loved, invested in, tamed, and so they are inconsequential. They are simply roses. They carry no familiar associations for the little prince. They raise in him no feelings of love and attachment. They have no history with him. His rose is special precisely because he has taken the time and effort to give her meaning and value. What matters then is the stuff and the people we put time, effort, and love into. And while his rose may not mean anything to anyone else, it matters not. She means the world to the little prince. And as the little prince says his goodbyes to the fox, he is told, one sees clearly only with the heart. It's the time you spent on your rose that makes your rose so important. You become responsible forever for what you have tamed. And so we learn here that love is an investment and a hard investment, and it always comes at a cost. As you know, the little prince and the rose don't have a seamless, easy relationship by any means. It's challenging for sure. But we must be vulnerable and open in order to love and to tame. And that comes at a very serious risk because, unfortunately, as we all know, there is a lot of loss in this book. And I think that the book is teaching us that the pain and the loss are worth the love, the time, the experiences, the investment, because the memories, the love, and the associations that you developed in that relationship will forever inform you, impact you, affect you. And in some ways, I think this book is arguing that in order to truly know and appreciate love, you must be very familiar with despair and loss. This is, of course, what the narrator experiences after the little prince leaves him. Even though the little prince has returned to his planet, the narrator looks to the 500 million stars in the sky, and he hears them twinkling like bells, reminding him of the little prince's laughter and presence. He knows that he is forever responsible for the little prince. And I think that this is such a beautiful lesson about life and love. And if you think about it, I mean, that is what matters in life, how we treat one another. The relationships we foster with one another give us real permanent meaning to us and everything else shall be discarded, buried, or forgotten, even us one day. In fact, think about how much remains of your great-grandparents. How much do you really know of them or their lives? What objects remain from their moments? Probably very few. 
As important as we think we are, we will be rendered obscure sooner than you think. And so I think this book is teaching us that what really matters in this life is not the money, the power, the busyness, the grades, the lifestyle, but rather the emotions, the feelings, and the love that we foster between one another in the here and now. These are just a few of the lessons that the Little Prince teaches us, and I do think they are so important for our standards of living, our mental and emotional health, our relationships, and the way we create meaning in our lives. And please understand that I'm not saying that all adults are cut off from love, affection, and the beauty of life, nor that every child has an imaginative, open mind that's free of cynicism. I think that you can easily argue that the author's identification of a grown-up and a child are defined by their behavior and not necessarily by their age and level of maturity, as I said earlier. But I do think that generally speaking, we could stand to learn a bit more from children whose hearts are more open, more creative, and purer at times. We can remember the child that we once were because that person is still in there somewhere. And also, as I said earlier, we're dealing with a story that has been categorized as an allegory, a fable, a fairy tale. Ask yourself if the kind of life that the little prince advocates is even truly possible in our society, or is it just a nice fantasy? Do we cultivate this life, or is it just this is what it is, and we must work within our circumstances? Let me know your thoughts down below, and please do share with us how this book has impacted you. Thank you so much for joining me, and please don't forget to check out some of my other lectures on children's literature, such as The Giving Tree, Where the Wild Things Are, Coraline, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and more. I will see you guys there.